We're looking forward to chatting with this next artist. He's danced with some of the biggest musicians on the planet, including George Michael, Britney Spears, Tony Braxton, Aretha Franklin, and of course, his groundbreaking turn as one of Madonna's lead dancers during her Blonde Ambition World Tour and documentary Truth or Dare. Salim Slam Haulus is here to talk about his illustrious career as well as about a documentary being released called Strike a Pose, which takes a look at Madonna's seven former dancers and what became of their lives after working with her. Salim, welcome to the Kelly Alexander Show. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm excited. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm a huge fan of your work, and uh, it's such an honor. And I did want to kick off the interview by asking you um, how you actually got into dance. Was it something that, you know, you were three or four years old and your parents put you into dance class? How did it start? Actually, I, I started as a gymnast. I always wanted to be a gymnast, but I, I wanted to be a female gymnast when I was younger. Like, uh, I was a big fan of Nadia Comaneci. So I thought it was going to be the next Nadia Comaneci, but I really realized, you know, that was impossible. So uh, my mom took me for an audition at the ballet school in, in Antwerp, Belgium. And I auditioned for the school the first time, and I didn't get in because they told me I was too fat. So I lost some weight, and I went the second, by, second time back to audition for the ballet school. And I don't got into the ballet school, and I must have been 12, 13 and from there, yeah, that's where my whole dance career started. Yeah, but I was pretty creative at a young age already. Like I remember going to to summer camps every summer, and already like at the end of the summer camp, there always be like a little party for all the kids, and I I would choreograph already little routines with like six girls around me. But I was always in the front, and everybody's always behind me. So at a younger age, I was already very creative, and I know I was I was going to do something in in the arts. Now, can you talk to us about how you went from, you know, being someone who does like more ballet type dancing to then dancing uh, like in a more of like a like a like a pop dancer? Like that's kind of not that it's a big stretch, but usually uh, I guess you see contemporary dancers doing it. But would you consider that that how you got to that next point in your career? Well, even when I even in Belgium, when I was in the ballet school at night, I would already uh, train in different kind of styles. Like I did jazz dance, I did street dance. So I was always kind of very versatile in all those things. And when I came to New York in 87, I mostly took classes. And actually, my first music video was uh, Lisa Lisa and the Cold Jam. That was my first music video. That is awesome. So, you know, I just, yeah, yeah. Do you know Lisa Lisa and I the Cold do. Jam? I do. I love that. Them? I yeah, totally yeah, do. Yeah, That's yeah. Yeah, that fantastic. was my first video that I did. But it just, you know, I mean, I did, I was in a ballet school, but I, I knew I was never going to be like the traditional ballet dance. I was not really interested into, in, in that so I knew I was always going to do something else. I just didn't really know exactly what it was. My dream, really, when I came to New York, I wanted to dance with Alvin Neely. That was really my big dream. And I thought he was going to see me in class and was going to make a big star of me. But that didn't happen. <laughs> so this, this whole, my whole journey, you know, I just went on a whole different, different road. Yeah, an audition for Madonna. And then just took my life to a whole different way than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, that's why, you know, and I learned from that too. You know, I never really make make any plans anymore just kind of go with the flow because if you make plans you know i i realize now you know it's it never really works out anyway it always life always takes you somewhere else so life took me more to the commercial world now can you talk about the decision to to uh audition for madonna like how did that even come about did you hear about it through your sort of dance community friends uh, it was actually in the newspaper. This is in 19, uh, 1990. Uh, it was in a newspaper called Backstage. And it said, Madonna looking, doing a new world tour, looking for dancers, no wannabes, looking for vocals, all kind of dancers. And I first wasn't even going to go, you know. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to go. But some of my friends kept saying, you should go, you should go. So I decided to go. And, and yeah, I, I got the job. But, you know, I wasn't like a really big Madonna fan at that time. I didn't really know anything about her. That, that's really what it was, I think. But, yeah, really, I got it out of a newspaper, yes. And when you went to the audition slam, like, how did that work? Like, who were you auditioning for? Was it Vincent Patterson? Like, who was there? No, it, it wasn't Vince Patterson. Uh, he came later into the picture. It was first... Uh, I, the name it was a contemporary choreographer i cannot recall the name i can't believe it she's a really she's an amazing contemporary choreographer but i i, I just can't recall her name right now but they had, at the audition it was nikki the backup singer was at the audition madonna was at the audition and and then also the choreographer the choreographer who was hired first yeah but madonna was for every audition you know for all the callbacks she was always there wow. so she really handpicked the people 
And can you tell us how, like, what vibe did Madonna give off at that point? Because, like, by this point, you know, you know, she'd been around for a while. And uh, I think her persona was obviously very much, like, in control and, and uh, very forward-thinking. Uh, how did she treat you guys in, in the audition process? She was tough and she kept doing, kept having us doing it over and over. But what really, like, amazed me, she was pretty down to earth because you would think, you know, such a big star already you know, that it would be a little bit less less social, but she was very social with all the dancers and, and, and really down to earth, but very tough. And we had to do it over and over again. And then we had to take our shirts off, you know, all of that stuff. So it was a lot of repetition. How do you um, figure that she she took to you? Like, what, what made you stand out to her slam? Oh, what made me stand out? Oh, that's a hard question for myself to answer. I just think... Probably a hard worker. I'm a very hard worker. I'm sure she saw that in me. And I'm not sure what she saw in me. But I'm sure it was a hard worker and handsome. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You, you are know. a hottie. <laughs> <laughs> she picked, you know, she picked us. That That's so amazing of her, you know. She picked like seven amazing dancers, you know. We were all so talented, hungry. We all came from different backgrounds and all that unified. It, it turned into such a beautiful thing. Can you tell us how the um, dancers got whittled down? Like, like how quickly did you know that it was going to be you and the six other guys, like like Kevin and Jose? Like, how did that come about? So after the audition, we, we finished the last callbacks, and I'm not, not exactly sure how many people were left. And a week later, uh, I got a call from Madonna personally uh, on my home phone, and she was like, hey, this is Madonna. Uh, do you want to go on tour with me? And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. But then I was also nervous because I didn't have working papers at that point. So I was like, oh, my God, how am I going to do that? And I immediately told her, but she told me not to worry about it, that they would take care of it. So I was like, oh, my God, this is super exciting. But again, at the same time, I think none of us, including Madonna, knew that it was going to be such a, you know, such a big big spectacle. You know, there was such a going to be such an amazing tour Mm -hmm. and that it would break so many barriers. I don't think any of us knew that. I definitely didn't. No, I just wanted to dance, be on stage and, you know, and shine. That was my thing. That was why I was the happiest. But I never knew that it was going to be such a political and break ground, you know, what all the things that people call the tour and Trudeau there. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Do you think it's because you guys were in a bit of a bubble slam, like when you guys were touring around the world, like you were in your own little circus kind of thing, like your own your own traveling caravan, if you will? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it was like, and, and traveling with Madonna on top of it. I hear, I hear new, now dancers, they, they stay in different hotels and everything. We were always right, like right next to Madonna, the same hotel, the same plane, you know, everything first class so it was definitely living in a bubble yes yes we're one of the biggest superstar stars in the world and on top of it a woman too how how amazing is that and in the record business in in the 90s i mean woman really had little voice in the record business i think in the music industry and she like oh here becomes this loud proud amazing voice Joining us on The Kelly Alexander Show is dancer, choreographer, and teacher Salim Khalous, better known as Slam. And you can learn more about him uh, on his website, salimkhalous.com. Slam, can you talk to us about uh, your relationship with the other six guys? Like, how quickly did you guys become tight, and who were you closest to during the tour? Mm, I think the closest, no, I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure. The closest, it was mostly Jose, Louis, and myself always hanging out. But I think... I think the closest I was to and the most I could relate to was Jose. Yeah, it weren't separate, separable. Yes, and also he showed me like, I mean, I went to a ballet school and I mean, I always knew I was gay. My whole family always knew I was gay and I'm very fortunate to have a family like that. So, but I never really been to like a gay club till 1990. Like a big, he, Jose used to take me to San Factory, all these amazing places, you know. So he's really the Jose is the one that actually introduced me to to the gay nightlife also because I, I had no idea about it. So Jose was definitely my buddy and still till this day, you know, he Jose brings the best out of me. That's why I love hanging hanging around him then and now too. Oh, he's such a sweet guy. I was so happy to have him on the show and I'm so yeah. happy to have you on the yeah. show. You're all so sweet. And speaking of, of, <laughs> of Jose, when you guys... Um, uh, you know, we're out and about on tour. And I know there's that, that sort of scene in, in the uh, Truth or Dare documentary when uh, you guys are sort of watching the gay pride parade. At that point, were you, like, because I know the cameras were filming and stuff, did you know you were going to kind of be quote-unquote outed or was it a surprise? 
outed as in being gay. Yeah, like like with regards to the public, because I know that I know that I, Gabriel, I think, had a problem with that, right? In the end. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't even think we were thinking. I definitely wasn't thinking about that. I was. I had so many other things on my mind. So. For me, it was never really a thing about outing. I was, I, I was always out. And were you, I know um, you've been very forthcoming about your HIV status, especially in the last little while, um, now that the documentary is out. Yes. Was that a, a heavy burden for you? Because I've read that, if, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, that you kept that to yourself during the tour. And I believe the other two dancers that had it as well kept it to themselves. Uh, yeah, yes, I kept it. I was diagnosed in 87 at age 18. And again, straight out of ballet school, and that is, you know, when when you get diagnosed at such a young age, you know, it's just like, oh my God, you know, your whole world falls apart. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? You know, all this hard work, I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be a great artist, you know, I wanted to find a boyfriend, you know, all of these things, you know, but when somebody tells you that at age 18, I was like, oh my God, you know, and everybody was dropping like flies, you know, lost so many friends, so many great artists. So for me, it was already, I kept it secret for, for so many, even for some of my family members, I kept it secret till the movie came out. They didn't even know. And I, I kept it secret, not because I, I was ashamed. I just kept it secret because I just, I didn't want to be treated differently. I didn't want people to worry about me, especially my friends and my, and my family. That's why I kept it so secret for so long time. And then I decided, it's like, well, the best way to really share it with people is to write a book. Mm-hmm. So I started writing and then a couple months later, I get an email from Raya, uh, Raya Swan and um, Esther Gold, the directors, and explaining us that they wanted to do a movie about us, a documentary. And I met them and I was like, okay, this must be the perfect om- opportunity for me to share, to share my story really with the world. You know, it's, you know it, it was all good on stage and everything, you know, but it was, it was so tough for so many years, you know, keeping that, that, that hidden. And, and it is very liberating. And I came... And the reason why I came out with my story too, not to like push other people out of the closet with their HIV status, just, you know, to, to make a statement, you know, it doesn't mean because the doctor tells you at age 18, you're only going to live for five years, you know, you have to believe that, you know, and I think I'm living proof of that, you know, that, you know, you just, you, you fight, you fight to take care of yourself, you know, at the end, you know, I think everything, you know, always turns out the way it's supposed to turn out. Mm-hmm. But my main thing was to come out of the closet with that, just to inspire other people. You know what? You can live with this for 30 years. You know, it doesn't mean that somebody tells you you're going to die, that you're going to die. That's fantastic. I'm so glad that, that you're doing that because I think there's so many people that are pulling yeah. um, hope and inspiration from, from you and Carlton because Carlton's, I think, upfront about it as well too, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. He was, I think, in his book, I read his book, he was diagnosed in 85. Okay, yeah, and not and not just for HIV, you know, for all kind of illnesses, you know, or disorders, you know. I mean, if you, you can beat it, you can do it, you know. You just got to change your your state of mind. And with me, what was the big big breakthrough that I that I felt like okay, I can conquer this was fear. I stopped being scared of it because that was killing me. And I know I still I get so emotional about it. But, you know, it was the fear, you know, it's like the fear. Am I going to die today? Am I going to die tomorrow? It was really tough times. And I just, like I say in strike a pose, if I can just help one person with it, you know, it would mean the world to me. Well, you're having, you're <laughs> having. I get all emotional. Well, of course, I, I can't even imagine the uh, the years of, of um, just, I think, even the burden of carrying that by yourself for so long. I know you said some family members knew, but that obviously was such a huge burden to carry. And you're definitely helping people by being so forthcoming today. And I really appreciate it. And, and I'm, I'm so honored to have you on the show. And I wanted to Thank ask you, you so much. I wanted to ask you when you were, um, you know, on the tour, because like I've interviewed a, a lot of dancers because I'm a huge fan of, of, of dance. And, and uh, you know, I've had a bunch of Janet Jackson's dancers on the show. And, and now I've had oh, you and, and Kevin and, and Jose. And I wanted to ask you, because I remember, you know, those videos that you were in. And obviously you were a big strap and fella and, 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 and very beautiful. What was the, the toll of, of the tour? Because obviously you guys are athletes being out on tour. Did your HIV status like make you tired? Like was it cha- more challenging for you because you had that going on as well? I mean, I, I was so in the Kelly, I was so in denial, you know, so for, for me, it didn't even exist. I never talked to any, anybody about it. I was just, I hit it so well that to the point that I didn't even think about it anymore, okay. you know, but did it affect my performance on, on stage? Absolutely not. No, no. That's when, that was when I was alive. That's when I, you know, that's when I didn't have to worry about anything when I was on stage. That's when I was free. Okay. Perfect. So that was, a, that was a big of my survival, uh, 
survival too. Yeah, just being on stage, but it, it definitely didn't didn't um, affect my uh, my yeah affect my performance, my HIV status. I was just always like scared. Oh my God, is you know is somebody going to find out? Are they going to do an HIV test? You know all those things. Okay. That that always was on my mind. And you never obviously told Madonna either, right? That you had the HIV status. No, okay. no, okay. no, no. Yeah, yeah. And and I get that asked a lot in the interviews, you know, because it was me. Carlton and Gabriel, who were in the number, um, uh, get into the groove. Yeah. And that's when Madonna, you know, she educates the people to, you know, put a condom on you, really, all of those, on, you know, all of those things, you know, it's like, oh my God. And I look back at that and I'm like, oh, it was us three and we both, we all three were infected. Right. I just think it, it, it wasn't the right time. And I, I'm sure the other guys felt like that too. It just, it was such a beautiful experience and I just didn't want to, be a Debbie Downer would come in saying, out, hey, I'm HIV positive, you know? Because right. at those times, people didn't even, people were so ignorant about it, we didn't know anything about this disease. So people didn't even use the same bathroom. They were cautious about drinking about the same glass of an HIV person. So it was a totally different story than it's now because we just didn't know anything about it. Talk to us about, you know, the day-to-day life of being on the tour. Obviously, we, we got the, the camera's view and, 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 you know, we got to see the behind the scenes. And it was so amazing, I think, especially for a lot of us who love uh, the pop world and, and everything that goes along with it. What was it like being on tour sort of off the stage? Like, did you have, you know, days where you could actually go and explore different parts of the city and, and all that sort of stuff? And did Madonna sort of go along with you or was she too busy with press? Well, Madonna is a workaholic, so she was always doing press. She was already probably working on her next project when we were on tour with us. But me and Jose, what we did, this is exactly what we did. We used to do the, sh- we used to do the shows. Me and Jose never went sightseeing. We couldn't care less at that time. So <laughs> our, sight- our sightseeing was like partying at night, going to all different kind of clubs and just, just having a good time, meeting all these new people, having everything given to you on a platform that was our that's what we did on our free time <laughs> okay perfect and, but great times great times that's awesome and and do you have a favorite um like if you look back on that tour what was your favorite cities that you actually visited that's a hard one to ask i must say probably uh, as far as performance i mean as far as show or as far as like both i'm sure i because i know certain uh, i know certain arenas like like here in montreal i'm Happy to say we always get told that we're like crazy fans. So I'm hoping maybe Montreal was one of your favorites too. But I'm assuming there's different um, different crowds and just how they are as, as people, just social social habitudes are, are different. I think probably as far as the show, I mean, that was the craziest was probably London, I must say. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, that was, uh, yeah, yeah, that was just crazy. And the amount of people and the screaming and then, you know, some people jumping on stage and then they... The security takes them off stage. No, no, it, it was just crazy. But as far as partying, I must say, I think Spain was probably my favorite um, favorite country, Barcelona. We had an amazing time in Barcelona. I remember that. That's yeah, awesome. but you know, every show, every city, every country was always different. But. I enjoyed it to the fullest. That's perfect. And can you tell us, Slam, when you're doing the show, what was your favorite number and, and which number, you know, was like more challenging and you're like, oh God, I don't want to do this one or, or like you had to really gear up for it? Mm, my favorite number, Express Yourself. I love to express yourself. And I also love Dick Tracy because I was playing Dick Tracy. Yeah, the hottie in the yellow suit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you're in France and she introduced me to the whole crowd. No, no, it was amazing. And also like a prayer. I really loved like a prayer, but that was really exhausting. Yeah, that was, it was like you were out of it, out of that number, after that number. But I would say those, like a prayer, express yourself and Dick Tracy. Okay. Those were my favorite numbers. How long was the show exactly? Like how long did you guys have for costume changes? Because I know it's very quick and I'm sure you guys had to super be on the ball with regards to your staging. Uh, it was pretty quick, and it was mostly done under the stage, and we had a dresser, too, who would help us uh, change into costume. But still, it was much easier for us than for Madonna herself. For her, it was just a crazy show. I still don't understand how she did all that dancing, singing, talking, I mean, changing costume. I think for her, it's much harder than it was for us, because at least we just had to dance. She had to sing and dance. Wow, and she's very adamant about singing live, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not everything was live, but I yeah. mean, it's more live than, than today, I think. Okay. 
Yeah, she's, people do shows. Yeah, she looked like a workhorse. That's for sure. Uh, so joining us on the show uh, is uh, is dancer and choreographer and teacher Salim Slam Khaulus. Again, you can learn more about him on his website salimkhaulus.com. Can you talk to us about again the cameras? Like, did you know that uh, the the documentary crew was going to become such an important part of that tour experience, or and did they become just part of the background at one point? Because I guess you get used to them. Yeah, because we also, you know, all, when they were not shooting, we used to hang out with them too. So they were they were kind of part of the family too. But we were told first that it was going to be a documentary, but just about the, the concerts. But it's like a whole concert that they would make um, a videotape out at those times. But then they realized, probably with all us characters, the dancers, you know, that behind the stage activity was much more interesting and and important, I guess, than just tape showing the performance. So that that came in later that that they were going to do that it was just going to be behind the scene and a little bit of of uh, concert footage, but again we didn't had no idea that it was going to be so groundbreaking and the kiss you know that I remember never knew that it would have such an impact on people. We never set out to do that. Mm-hmm. We just were being ourselves. And speaking of that of that kiss and and sort of just again you guys um, clearly being you know very gay dancers at the time and and uh, yeah. I want to know what. <laughs> Um, what's the response been Slam? Because like I, I've, again, I've read lots of uh, of interviews and and lots of you know just press with regards to the Strike Opposed documentary, and it just seems like so many people are, are are coming up to you and Kevin and Jose and the rest of the gang, and it sounds like you guys really changed their lives. How does that feel knowing that you had such impact on on young people at the time who who were coming to terms with their own sexuality? It feel it feels amazing. I feel honored. I feel blessed. It, it's just it's an ama- an amazing experience, and especially the think you were just playing some some silly game you know just like with the kiss you know to the day i'd say there i kiss gabriel but we just did it because it was a it was a game and it was a hot guy and i wanted to kiss him but then later on you know we find out like how you know how it really changed people's life not just the kiss but also you know us being ourselves being gay being flamboyant being proud you know we had no limits and i think that really you know, attracted people, you know, and it's it's amazing, like 27 years later on, that people still want to know what we're doing or still listen to us. Mm-hmm. And and at those times, there was no social media neither. I started realizing that we did make an impact when I started getting a website. And that was must have been like in, in, in 2000, probably. I was, I'm very late with technology always. <laughs> I'm very bad at it, too. But that's when I started getting emails from different people saying you know how we changed their life how you know how we just yeah how we were like a role model it's it's it's, i don't like calling my myself a role model because it just feels a little bit strange i've got to get used to it but we get emails still till this day all the time you know thank you for just being you really Mm -hmm. yeah and i'm sure the other dancers yeah they every we all still get so much love and it's just it's, it's a beautiful thing i'm so proud of it that's amazing and i have to say i've been all over your website i think you have a great website so don't worry about that thank I think- <laughs> you thank you my, my husband made it yeah, oh yeah, that's he does great for me <laughs> well he does, he's doing a good job it's very cool and it's very thank easy you. to navigate so a high five to your husband um uh, yay. I, I wanted to ask you too uh you know again in the documentary and i know it's it's very easy to sort of edit things and 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 make things look differently than how they are in some regard in the truth or, or dare documentary it seems seems that, uh, you know, Madonna is very protective of, of all of you and, and very caring, um, along with being her sort of naughty and, and you know, uh, just, you know, pushing the envelope <laughs> type of type of girl that she is. Did you guys really feel close to Madonna? Because I know, again, interviewing other dancers, like, like a bunch of Janet dancers, they really feel like they became part of Janet's family. Did you feel that way about Madonna? Yeah, yeah, we totally became a family. That's why in the end of the movie, I was so emotional. It was such a shock when it was over. I couldn't believe it. I, I thought that she was going to say, okay, let, let's start rehearsing for our next door. You know, I, I just, I couldn't believe it was all, all over. So we, we definitely were a family. Yes, yes. But I, I still, I think my biggest connection with Madonna was on stage. I know a lot of the dancers, I think they feel a little bit more attached to her. But I think my biggest connection with Madonna was on stage. And that's why we were partnered so many times together in the show too. Okay. But I definitely, yeah, we were a, f- a family. And it was it a was beautiful family too. <laughs> Interesting family members. <laughs> that's true. That is, I'd love to have you all over for Thanksgiving dinner. I'm sure it'd be awesome. Um, can you talk to us? Because you mentioned again uh, how emotional you were at the end of the tour. What was it like, uh, that transition from finishing? Again, because that tour was so epic and, and so well-known across the entire planet. 
What was it like for Slam to return to quote unquote normal life? Like what was up next after that that tour? And did you have to take time to sort of like, I don't know, did you get depressed after? Like how did that roll out? For me, the tour was over. That meant I had to deal with my HIV status. And I was very nervous for that. So after the tour, I, I kept working here and there. I started modeling. I did that a little bit, but still all hidden and scared, you know, that I'm not going to die of HIV and all of that. And then also after the tour, because at one point I was like, you know, it, it's pointless for me. You know, I'm going to die anyway. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so I, I was illegal in the country, I would say, for like at least six years, too. That was illegal here, so that was an, 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 another strike against me. So I was, I, I was gay, I was HIV, and I was illegal. So I was like, okay, how do I ever get out of this? You know, mm-hmm. so it, it was a really hard time. But then in 2000, I know it took a long time to get me out of this dark hole. I met the love of my life, Fakundo Gaba, and he just, you know, because I was, I was illegal here, and I was scared to go get treatment, because I was like, okay, if I go to the hospital, they're going to call immigration. So I, I, that was one of the reasons why I never got treatment neither until I, in 97, I literally dropped to the floor and they had to rush me to the hospital because I had a really bad ammonia and I had T-cell count 12 and my viral load was like through the roof. But then I realized at that point that there are many organizations out there who help you, who give you free medication. They never talk, they never call it immigration. You know, so I made up this whole story even before I knew what was really going to happen. But again, now it's so different. You know, you have so many more, more outlets, you know. Wow. So it, it was a tough time, a tough time. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> but that's so. again, you know, I mean, look, look you know, it, it was so bad, you know, but at the end of the tunnel, you know, I learned in life, you know, mm-hmm. there was always some kind of light, you know, and if you follow that light and you follow your heart, you know, I think, you know, you can overcome all those things. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm so glad you finally got help because I had no idea you had to wait so many years before you were actually on medication. So during the whole Blonde Ambition Tour, you were not on any protocol? Oh, no, 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 nothing. And at those times, they didn't even have to, the effective cocktails available neither. Wow. I think people were taking AZT at the time, and that was killing a lot of people too because it was like, it was so strong, and a lot of people couldn't take the, the medication. And I think Gabriel passed away like a month or a couple of months before the, the effective cocktail was available for people. Okay. And did you actually, speaking yeah. of Gabriel, I wanted to ask you, because um, I think, was it nine, 1995 he passed away? Somewhere around there, right, I think? Yes, yeah. 1995, yes. And, and how did you find out? Like, when did you find out? And, and, and how did it make you feel, Slam? Because obviously, that's a huge shock. It made me feel guilty. It's like, wait, why, why am I alive and why, why did he die? You know, it was a big guilt, feel, guilt feeling too. Yeah, and I, fi- I don't think I find out probably like maybe a couple of months after he passed away because I still wasn't active on, on, on the computer at all. Like I didn't know anything about, you know, how to Google, I didn't know anything. Yeah. So I found out a little bit afterwards, but, but just the guilt feeling, you know, it's like, wait, why does he pass away and, and I'm still here? So I, I, I struggle with that always a little bit too. And still to this day, when friends of mine still to this day die of AIDS, you know, it's like, wait, why, why not me? Why them? So mm-hmm. I struggle with that kind of on a daily basis. But I, I'm sure at the end, you know, when, when everybody, you know, goes somewhere, I'm sure we find out what the reason is. <laughs> mm-hmm. And do you and Carlton ever talk about that? Because does he, do you think he goes through the same guilt feelings as well? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, we... The great thing what was with Carlton too when I you know when I told all the dancers in Striker Pose about my situation, now I can call Carlton, you know, and be like, Okay, listen, I went to the doctor and whatever he wants me to do this, you know, I have somebody to like more like talk, you know, have you ever gotten this done, you know, have you ever, ever gotten this vaccine, something, you know. So so it's confident that I know that I can call him and just ask him some questions to him and we can talk about it, yes. That's fantastic. Now, I did want to speak a little bit about Gabriel. Um, when you guys came together to do the Strike a Pose documentary, and obviously, you know, he's no longer with us, was it, like, super emotional right away? Like, and, and was it almost like a physical feeling knowing that he wasn't there, like like your left arm was missing, for example? Yeah, it was sad. It was sad, but it was... It, it was every time we, when we do it, in, if, when we did an interview in different countries or... Yeah, you know, in America, there was always, we would sit around the table, of six of us, and then there would always be like an empty chair, really. and not even just an empty chair, some, sometimes like an empty space. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and we definitely, we definitely feel that, he, that, he, that he's with us, he's completely with us. And I know um, in the beginning it was hard for him, you know, with the whole kiss and everything, but I know that he's proud of this and that he changed a lot of lives too. 
Yeah, and what's really beautiful, you know, this this movie has brought me so much closer to his mom. Like we just had the, the opening here at the IFC, IFC theater uh, in Manhattan on on Wednesday night, and mm-hmm. Sue Tupin came down, and she she's coming. She came down for a couple other festivals too. So I, you know, we always talk about Gabriel. I find 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 out more things, what he was like, and she asks me questions. You know, it, it's a beautiful thing. It's like I'm talking to Gabriel through his mom. Oh, that's <laughs> so great! That's awesome. Yeah, Joining- she's really she's a beautiful person too. Joining us on the Kelly Alexander Show is dancer, choreographer, and teacher uh, Salim uh, Haulus. Again, you can learn more about him at salimhaulus.com. Um, what do you want audiences to take away from from Strike a Pose, uh, Salim? Because I know that it's so prolific, and again, there's so many ardent fans of Madonna. And again, because she highlighted you and the other six dancers, there's so many fans of you. So, what was the question again? I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> my, super, my super just knocked on the door and I'm not opening. <laughs> That's okay. I just wanted to know, what do you want people to take away from the, from the movie? Oh, what do I want them to take away from the movie? I don't know. There's so many, you know, there's so many stories in one movie. Just, you know, hope. For me, it's all about hope, you know. Even when you're in the darkest space, you know, whatever you go through, you know, there, there's always hope, you know. For me, the movie is about humanity, hope about survival about love it's about so many things you know Mm -hmm. so i think it whatever people yeah are attracted to you know i think it has so many angles the movie yeah and uh i I, uh, yeah it does make sense and i i i know when i interviewed kevin and jose at the mo at that time madonna had not yet been to any of the screenings do you know yet if she's seen the screening and have and and have you talked to her at all Supposedly, what the directors told us that Liz Rosenberg, uh, who was a PR at uh, at that time, has seen the movie and she really enjoyed the movie and that she forwarded to Madonna. But we never heard anything back from her. But I'm almost sure that she saw the movie. She's so nosy too. Of course, she's seen the movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. If you could, if you could speak to Madonna today, um, and actually, for, um, I guess my first question is, when was the last time you actually spoke to her? Back in like '91, when the tour finished, or? Yeah, a long time ago. Yes, very long time ago. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and '91, '92. Oh wow. Okay, so it's been a while. Yeah. If you could speak to her today, what would you what would you say to her? That's a hard question. I knew you were going to ask. I don't know why. <laughs> I would just say, not sure. I said, that's a hard thing. It's not sure, you know. I mean, it's 27 years later on, you know. Mm-hmm. The only thing I would probably say is like, you know, thank you. Thank you for giving me your name in this business. Thank you for being really the first person to fight for gay rights, to fight for, for women rights, you know, all of those things, you know. Thank you for that because I think she really got the ball rolling. And I'm probably just give her a big hug. That's awesome. Did <laughs> and you... I shake her a little bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, uh, did you follow her career a lot in the, in the years after? Or did you sort of, because I know you said initially you were not a big fan of her, so did you sort of not really know what she was up to very much, like uh, professionally? After the tour? Uh, yeah, yes, I, you know, I, I follow her on YouTube. You know, I've watched mostly of all of her tours. Yeah, so okay. I would say I, I follow her, yes, yes. And do you feel like you guys are part part of a special club in a way, meaning like not just the uh, the seven of you who danced with her during that time, but all the other dancers. Because I know like, again, if I can bring it back to Janet for a second, like all of her dancers, I've, I've interviewed a bunch of them from the different tours and they all sort of feel like they're part of a, uh, like a, like a club, if I can put it that way. That a they've all, Yeah, exactly. Like they've all <laughs> the danced. The Madonna club. Yeah, exactly. So do you guys feel like you have um, like a brotherhood and a sisterhood with some of the other dancers that have, have danced with her? Like from other tours? Yeah, from other, like have you met some of the other dancers that have um, been on? I mean, I know some of the other dancers, but do we feel connected to them? Mm, I don't know. Okay. It was so different, you know. I think we were, she opened up much more to us. It was much more personal, our relationship with her, I think, than with the dancers that came after us. Oh, and okay. that's why, that's what I've heard about the dancers too, that she was just not, not that social and just didn't really hang out that much as she did that with us. I mean, we were always hanging out. Okay. And after I wanted to so ask do you, I feel like no I was just going to say but do I feel like any kind of connection mm, not really no no Okay okay and after the tour was over I did want to ask you this having worked for her and having that on your resume was it easier or harder to get a gig after Mm vice versa it was like if sometimes it would help like even till today it it still helps that fashion productions that having that name on it has opened on my resume has opened so many doors but at the same time, it has closed a lot of doors, too, because of people, they have a problem with her or they envy you because you did work with one of the biggest superstars in the world. So it was like it was both ways for me in addition. 
Okay. You know, I never, I never walked into an audition again as a regular dancer, and I would, and I would wonder what I would feel like. You know, I would, oh, you always have that name Madonna at that, and some people loved it, and some people hated it. And uh, you know, I, I know off the top we talked about how you, you, you know, dance for other artists, including George Michael. What did you do with him? Because obviously, a lot of us are extremely sad that he recently I, passed away. I did. Uh, Papa was a Rolling Stone. Oh, okay, okay. Remember that video I was shot in the subway and everything? He's not in the video, but he was there. It was uh, just all models and dancers, and it was all, like, cool on the subway, mm -hmm. graffiti, but it was called Papa Was a Rolling Stone, yes. Did you ever get to, to talk with him, or, or what was it like having him on set? Uh, no, because he's shy, and I'm, I'm very shy, too. I know it doesn't come, <laughs> over, come <laughs> over like that. But I'm really shy, especially, like, with, you know, with, like, people that... I'm super talented. I get very kind of intimidated and shy. So no, we didn't talk. No, I was too too shy. Okay. I should have. What did you What did you feel like though when the, when you heard the news that he'd passed away? Because I know for any of us that are big fans of of artists from the '80s and '90s, like I was devastated. What, yeah, how did yeah, you feel? sad. You know, we it's just sad. You know, we lost so many great great artists. You know, and and yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's just sad. It's 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 it's, it's sad news. Yeah, mm -hmm. and now but then again, you know, I I also, you know, I so many people die daily on a daily, uh, you know, die on a daily basis, you know. But then when a celebrity dies, you know, it's like yeah. oh, it's a big deal, you know. So I try to always stay a little bit more grounded and. You know, that, that's part of life, you know. Mm -hmm. People die and people get born, yeah. Like my mom passed away uh, a month and a half ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. And she was going to be in the, my, uh, she was going to be in the film too, but at the end they, they uh, decided not to put it in the film. And um, she, she didn't go to any of the premieres. Like Jose's mom, she still hasn't seen uh, the movie. But then right like two weeks before they showed it in Belgium on the on the TV. So and then my mom two weeks before she passed away she saw the movie. Oh I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, but and, and, and I asked it's so European. My mom is, you know, such a strong woman. I am who I am because of my mom, you know. Okay. I asked her, so did you cry did you cry? She said, No, no, why? <laughs> <laughs> She's a tough so lady. So strong, so beautiful. And yeah, now yeah. but again, you know, when regular people die, you know, they, they don't make a big deal out of it. But then the celebrity dies, you know. It's true. It's, it's true. And, yeah. And now that so you, I try to stay grounded with that. And now that you guys, by the way, are all, um, you know, sort of uh, came together again for this project, uh, are you uh, are the six of you going to stay tight for life now? Because it just feels like it's a it's a stronger bond. Anytime I see press with you guys or, or uh, interviews, it just seems like you guys are super, super tight again. Yes, yes, yes. And I hope, you know, I hope, we, you know, they, they live in Los Angeles and Oliver lives in, in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, but I hope, I hope we stay tight. You know, I hope we stay connected. Yeah, yeah. And definitely my bond with Jose has grown, you know, has grown so much stronger. And that, that, that makes me the happiest. I love all of the guys, but I always had a soft spot for Jose as a friend. Okay, yeah, that's so very cute. soft spot for him. And, and, and our relationship, you know, I'm finding more and more about him. He's a beautiful person, Jose. He's very sweet, and I was so he was so sweet during yeah. our interview. I, I loved having him on the show. And and Slam, before I let you go, um, what's up next for you? Because I just want to make sure your fans know what you're up to. Like I know you've got the still the uh, the stuff to do with Strike a Pose, but what can people expect to, from you in the next year? Ah, uh, I don't know. I'm working on my book. I have some interest already from from some publisher. I just gotta keep writing. It's the hardest thing sitting down and writing and. And one of the people that's interesting in it told me, it's like, listen, you just got to write one page a day and then in one year you have a book, <laughs> you know, but it's just hard for me to sit down and I started, but I just, it's hard for me to keep going, but I will. So I, I want to write my book because I want to write more about my experience, the details, you know, as far as like the whole, definitely, you know, the HIV thing, you know, the things that I do to keep healthy, the diet, the meditation, the exercise. So I, I I'm working on that. And I'm working on a couple things too, but you know, in this business, everything is very secret, so I can't say anything about that. But it's not the last time you will hear from us, definitely oh, not. Perfect. <laughs> and you and you promise me you'll come on the show when your book's out because I'd love to have you yes, back on. Yes, yes, I want to. I would love to. Yes, yes, I want to meet you too in person. Oh, I would love to give you a big hug. <laughs> trust me. And I just want to yes, thank me you. Too. I just want to thank you so much for doing this because you know you're such a sweet person. And and uh, again, I told you off air before we started the interview that you know I looked up to you when I was a kid. And and uh, thank you so oh, much for everything you. you guys did because no, I. No, thank you. Oh, fantastic. So um, that is, uh, again, Salim Haulus. Again, you can uh, learn more about him on his, his website, SalimHaulus.com. Salim, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.